हेलो 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 ओके अच्छा एक आने दाढ़ी बोलूँ क्या आई कैन मूव कल के हो गया चलिए हेलो वेल इट्स फोर ओ क्लॉक एंड एज आई सेड फोर ओ क्लॉक मीन्स फोर ओ क्लॉक सो आई एम गोइंग टू स्टार्ट बाई गिविंग यू अ शॉर्ट इंट्रोडक्शन टू दिस सीरीज एंड देन एन इवन शॉर्टर इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ द स्पीकर दिस इज ए सीरीज इन थिंकिंग ऑफ Uh, starting for a very long time and we would like to call it the tcg crest colloquia series and this uh, uh, the idea of this colloquia series is it will cover all areas of science and technology and uh, connect to um, the society at large in which we live and one of the things that thought that is missing in most of our science and technology education is the history of science and technology so you live in a society and you see developments that are going to you know taking place you don't quite put them in context unless you understand the historical context of where and how and who under what circumstances have done the work that has led to new developments in science and technology and this has been true from the beginning of time and beginning of civilization as far as we know and so this b has been in our bonnet that we do not teach of science in schools and colleges and we do not people do not come into contact at all with the historical context and so therefore you know we were kind of hanging around to have the proper context to begin this series with and then we found the perfect person and that's dr shekhar mande and those of you who are in crest you have heard a lecture by him tomorrow 
I will not repeat that for you, but uh, I understand that it's being broadcast on YouTube. So I'll uh, tell you very briefly that he is one of our most distinguished scientists in the country. He has, um, he's a physicist and biologist and computational biologist, and he told us uh, about scales of things which um, are very physics-y, but ended up with conclusions to do with electrostatics, which has incredible significance to geometry and uh, therefore to biology, so he could try in Pauling in this uh, business. And it's only with you know, hindsight that most of us are able to make these uh, things connect. Um, you should uh, Google him, and you will see the accolades he has held. I'm not going to do this, but I'm just going to say something that he has promised. In India, uh, those of us who have, uh, um, we have a, what um, my friends uh, call the standard model of Indian science. And if you want to know what the standard model is, is go to you know, any book in Indian history. And Shekhar tells me that he can go beyond the standard model. And uh, we are all eagerly uh, waiting to hear beyond the standard model of Indian science and Indian technology post-independence. So please welcome Dr. Shekhar Mande, who's going to give the inaugural uh, Crest Colloquia. And please stay, because there will be more in the future. The first one for you, Shekhar. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhada, once again. Uh, I'll begin like yesterday. I mean, the first time I spoke about this thing was on 29th December. That was an Ayuka's Foundation Day. And Shumak wanted me to talk a little bit about Indian science, how it has developed and all. And at the end of it, uh, almost <coughs> all the people in Ayuga came and said that they had not thought beyond Bhava and Sarabhai of how Indian science developed. You know? And I said, there's Bhava and Sarabhai are only two icons. But it's way many more things that have happened in Indian science that all of us deserve to know. And I want to give you a few examples of that, that how India adopted science and technology like no other nation in the world and how that has actually brought us here today, what we are. I mean, we should be very proud that we are one unique nation which has adopted science and technology, which has recognized science and technology for our this thing. So it's something which we should be very extremely proud of. I'll give you a number of examples of this beyond Bhava and Sarabhi, of course, as I said, and let us see how it goes. Uh, history is a subject in which very often when we take ourselves back to the era, we find it very difficult to believe how that era was, you know. And let me remind you here that uh, about 20 years ago, it's less than 20 years ago that the mobile phones had just come in the market. You know, I mean, I didn't have a mobile phone in 2001 myself. I don't know how many of you had a mobile phone in 2001, right? <coughs> Ripla, uh, shifted to Hyderabad and she joined a company called GVK. Right? And then she had a mobile phone and instantly our family was, entire family was taken over by it. You know, Gaga, like Sharmila is a real star of our family. She can go anywhere around and she can still talk on the phone. You know, I mean, that's something, I mean, I don't know how many of you remember that era. Today, it's difficult to, for us to even remember that era. But she had a mobile phone which was this big and were heavy to carry. And probably she, when she talked, she had to probably hold it like this or something like that. Today, of course, I mean, things have become much, much more easier. And in fact, today we can even do Google sitting here in the room. You know, I mean, it's amazing. And it's therefore difficult to imagine how life was some years ago. The people of my generation here in the audience would recall how we were as kids when we were growing up. You know, when the, the things were not so affluent. I belong to a perfectly middle class family. I, was, I did not come from a poor family. It was a middle class family. But yet, I would get new set of clothes only once a year, either during the Shara or Diwali. And I'm sure it's true with all of you. For getting the gehu or chawal or sugar 
we used to go to the ration shop very often if the kerosene van did not come we found it difficult to have stores in the house one stores in the house for a family of four to get one liter of milk every day i had to stand in the queue early in the morning at 5 o'clock the van would show up at something like 6 6:30 but i would be standing already one and one hour in the queue and this was with all of us i don't know whether it was anything different for any one of you can you imagine that is my own childhood i am not talking of 100 years ago right i am only talking about 40 or 50 years ago how things were but things have so dramatically changed over a period of time that we often forget what happened yesterday and things have been changing continuously and have been changing because and as i said once again because we had opted science and technology as the vehicle of growth india became independent in 1947 trust me in 1947 plus minus 5 or 10 years about 60 or 70 countries became independent they got rid of colonial rule at that time entire africa south east asia a lot of them became independent <coughs> india stands out as one single country which has made so much progress believe me the western powers and the affluent nations then would not have believed that india would even sustain for 5 years the entire world believed that india is going to disintegrate in no time and when jawaharlal nehru talked about trist uh, destiny trist destiny he mentioned that india has adopted democracy as the model of growth democracy as a model of governance and india looks for get for forward to gaining her rightful place in the world order that's what what he said most people believe including british and americans that india will not survive more than 5 or 10 years it's going to disintegrate in no time the problems were so huge the problems are so huge and the problems were huge because the british had robbed us of think of anything they had been robbed of that everything that was possible in the country when the british landed here the last of the iconic battles was 1818 there's the battle of uh, koregaon and bhima and the battle of khadki there's a maratha empire which was actually ruling the most part of the world at that time science and technology was highly developed in the country one of the most advanced scientific nations in the world trust me was india you know today's people don't believe that indian science was so well developed royal society sent a delegation of 12 fellows of royal society to india in 18th century to catalog how india we do things how do we make steel the steel making process in india was much better than what michael faraday would do imagine that amazing and it's all cataloged in royal society library the way they found one particular person sitting under a tree and doing skin graft cutting skin from here and putting it on here was unbelievable in medicine how would you do that a skin graft it was done in india india as i said metallurgy was highly developed india's astronomy preceding newton i'm you talk of newton indian calculations of planetary positions with madhava school and bhaskara and all was outstanding preceding newton what are we talking about western science doesn't recognize these facts that science was so highly developed in this particular country fibonacci recognized in 12th century that the counting of decimals on our finger 0 1 2 3 4, 5, was the most advanced things that he could ever have thought of fibonacci around 12 12 13 or 12 14 or something he has made this particular statement and indian science and technology was developed that was adopted as a part of our system and because of that one of the because of that also india was extremely good in trade and if you read shashi tharoor's book the era of darkness you realize that in 1800 india's share of world gdp was 23% in 1700 it was 27% world's gdp 27% share was india's so the most affluent countries today you don't match that kind of affluence anywhere in the world british systematically destroyed piece by piece everything they destroyed our education system the way they wanted to educate us was essentially to make us babus who can run things on the ground here they adopted a financial system 
so that a babu would raise all kinds of objections on the file so that money would not be spent here unfortunately british left but we have still adopted the financial system we have not changed that so the entire effort was made to dismantle everything the kings who had opposed british especially the mathas right you go to maharashtra there are about 50 or 60 different forts iconic forts that there none of them actually stands today the not the same way as the intact forts that you see elsewhere in the country the people who yielded to them those actually are standing to the history but the ones otherwise not so that's how we were actually left in that particular system and some accounts of history are available here and there shithurur of course has made some account very forceful arguments this is not a very readable book i don't think it's uh, i would not recommend reading this particular book indian summer but nonetheless the opening paragraph of this book is something the book begins with a very very interesting uh, sentence and let me read it read out for you in the beginning there were two nations one was a vast mighty and magnificent empire brilliantly organized and culturally unified which dominated a massive swath of the earth the other was underdeveloped semi feudal riam driven by religious factionalism and barely able to feed his illiterate disease stinking masses the first one was india the second was england this is taken from the book called indian summer this is the opening statement of the book once again i am not recommending that you read the book but nonetheless to some extent it does reflect the fact that when britain british people came here they made sure that we were denied the fruits of the first industrial revolution they made sure that we were also denied the, the fruits of the second revolution industrial revolution our education system was deprived anyone who actually wanted to start a good education system in india like pandit madan mohan malviya they denied those opportunities until it was very persistently uh, followed that uh, till the end and so on and so forth right and there are examples calcutta of course has seen much of the history of the british jesse bose was denied to start uh, the institute he was not given funds when he went to university to teach he was not given salary equivalent to a white man for two years he taught without taking a pay from british eventually british realized their mistakes and eventually gave him the salary is a different matter altogether but there was a clear classism that there was a class which was dominated by the white skin people and as a class that all of us belong to and that's how we were when we were independent we had only 17 universities in the country that's how our education system was only 17 universities and let us look at how actually we started building that up and as i said therefore the immediate task in 1947 was to start building a ecosystem in which we take snt we adopt snt and start implementing snt based solutions for everything that we see in our society and we have still long way to go to catch up uh, with the most affluent countries but yet the progress that we have made is because we have adopted that uh, over the years but let me give you some examples of that the first thing was actually to begin building institutes in the country that is the first of the objectives and uh, that came about the csir had begun about 5 years before the independence 1942 and i will give you a brief history of csir but we had the indian council of agricultural research that came into being in 1947 the medical research 49 the department of atomic energy i will give you a bit of history of that 1954 and so on so forth so many of the scientific departments that were given public grants from the government they came with this particular similarly ugc came into being in 1953 the first ugc chairman was none other than shanti swarup bhatnagar and uh, uh, iit of the iits iit kharagpur was founded in 1950 and by the time we had five iits it was over 1960 the state universities started being founded most of the states demanded that there should be state universities so pune university came into being bangalore university came into being and so on so forth so uh, uh, on one hand we had an ecosystem that was being generated for supporting science systematically through public funds on the other we also started actually making some very very good educational institutions so that we could educate masses one of the first task given was this but let me actually tell you a bit of history of how this organization started before we actually come to the first task so 
like i said csir was the first publicly funded organization in the country uh it owes its genesis to an editorial in nature in 1933 uh sir richard grigory who was the editor who had visited india and had argued for a publicly funded snt in india but british being british they forgot about it they put it under under the carpet until a person called sir arcot ramaswami mudliya was a member of the british commerce council he came into picture and he suggested that we should actually take this up once again and principally because of his effort and he was also backed up by some of the very very well known people one of them being abdul khwaja hamid the person who had founded a company called sipla the central indian pharmaceutical limited or something like that sipla what is known today as sipla uh, yusuf hamid's father the today chairman is yusuf hamid his father so they actually together uh, convinced the british to start what is called as the board of scientific and industry in 1940 that was founded in calcutta and uh, that eventually uh, soon became industrial research utilization committee in 1941 once again based in calcutta and then the headquarter moved to delhi in 1942 and it became eventually what is called today what we call as the council of scientific and industrial research uh, which was registered under the societies registration act in 1942 was the first publicly funded snt organization in the country so the immediate task was of course the government british government said that we will give you about a 1 million rupee something at that time and you do whatever with it so arkad rama swami mudliyar and khaja hamid and all convinced shanti swarup bhatnagar who was then professor in lahore to move over to csir and he came to csir as the first director general and bhatnagar started contacting many many different people that uh, to raise money and of course the first other persons uh, who came forward to support the private industrial houses which came to support indian science no surprise was of course tatas so tatas came and said that one fifth of the grant we will give you not only we will give you one fifth of the grant that government gives you we will also give you piece of land in jamshedpur where you can actually start a metallurgical laboratory so even today the national metallurgical laboratory which exists in jamshedpur that land belongs to tata steel it doesn't belong to csi so okay, that's how tata has also suggested to bhatnagar that let us try to raise money through crowd sourcing what today we call as crowd sourcing let us appeal to the public general public and see how much money we get and uh, the success it was uh, quite successful through an appeal that was made by grd and by bhatnagar they were able to raise rupees 4000 from the mercantile association of calcutta so that's the money that actually we generated 44000 rupees as a grant the first initial grant from crowdsourcing from them and grd actually wrote a letter to bhatnagar at some point of time and is very hilarious uh, uh, comment in that he says i am disappointed that the response from the general public has been so poor particularly from jamshedpur public whose total contribution to a surprisingly low figure of rupees 501 so uh, that's what jrd wrote to bhatnagar saying that i mean we believe that I mean, people of india would rise and support uh, this particular endeavor but it not happen and in fact uh, at luck would have it tata had forgotten to give the money to csir and bhatnagar then wrote to tata saying that sir you have promised me money but you have not given money and then came a letter saying that i have your letter of 8th instant regarding contribution due from sir ratan tata trust i have been informed that the check for rupees 3.7 lakhs has been forwarded to you today with a letter from the chairman of the trust of lady ratan tata you know that's how he wrote back and in fact when i was narrating this story about how tata supported csir in the early days to jairam ramesh jairam ramesh is an extremely well aware person i mean i don't know you have to meet him to uh, to admire his sense of uh, everything you know i mean it's a really amazing person so when i met jairam ramesh he said is that before tfr or after tfr as a tfr discussions came out of csi so csi is the first organization tfr was born out of csi so he said no no you are i don't believe it so then he said do you have documentary proof i said in csi you don't pass ask documentary proof you trust my words you know i mean i cannot give you documents two days later jairam ramesh sent me a email with all these letters attached to that he said i wrote to the tatas and i have got the original copies of the letter i am enclosing for your perusal so these are the letters he sent me that particular point of time well so the uh, the trust of the tatas has been so good over the years what you see here 
is the executive council of the national aerospace laboratory for a long time it was chaired by jrd uh, tata right so executive council committee of uh, this thing what we today call as research councils was chaired by jrd at that particular point of time and when i came to csir i realized that our contact with i don't want to i mean of course i should market myself uh, that uh, the, our connect with industry has started losing i called up number of industrialists and i said that you will have to chair our research councils and management councils and many of them accepted so i'm glad that uh, today we have re established our connect with industry and uh, the uh, the cmd of tata projects now chairs one of our research councils the cmd of apollo hospitals she chairs one of our research councils and so on so forth uh, the the vice senior vice president of reliance chairs one of our research councils and so on so forth i've been able to at least in my tenure i've been able to re establish the connect with industry but this was the weight that indian science enjoyed at that time that people like khwaja abdul hamid and jrd and all we are actually interested in taking the indian science forward and uh, by the creation of tfr itself is very interesting uh, by 1945 the dorobi tata trust had decided to start a fundamental research institute in the country and for that of course they were seeking support the support came from three different quarters one is of course the tata trust supported the other is the bombay province they supported and the third is of course the central government supported and the central government support came in terms of a grant from csir i mean that's how even today's management council of csir has a, a, a central government representative that the government nominates maharashtra government because bombay eventually converted into maharashtra and tata trust and then csir continued increasing his contribution to tifa over a period of time like that and uh, batagar was the member of the first management council of uh, tifa then and uh, many of these actually you can see there somewhere here but as the tfr was being founded 1945 other things had also had started rolling down and one of them was bhaba's persuasion with the government that india must have a strong atomic energy program you know we had just come out of the world war 2 and people had actually said that for national security even for peaceful purposes we must have an atomic energy program so that tomorrow somebody can cannot come and stream roll over us you know i mean we had to have that and indeed a uh, lot of people supported bhaba ks krishnan bhatnagar all of them said that if bhaba says so uh, it must happen all the discussions happened in the hall of national physical laboratory and uh, uh, principally because of uh, all those discussions in 1946 the bsir which was a part of the csir set up atomic energy committee research committee under bhaba's uh, leadership the committee recommended in 1948 48 the tfr should be the center of all large scale nuclear physics in india and that's how the nuclear program started and then it was really that apart from bhaba there were not too many people who understood nuclear physics around so then csir decided that it is going to choose 10 people who would be sent to us trained in atomic and nuclear physics and they will be brought back and the first set of people were then actually sent to us with a grant of 32400 they came back and then the atomic energy commission was set up in 1948 as the rebound of scientific research and the formation of uh, atomic energy was signed by none other bhatnagar so this is a government circular om gazette notification saying that india will have department of atomic energy under the chairmanship of bhaba krishnan and bhatnagar and signed by bhatnagar that india will have such a uh, kind of a thing so institution building is actually a fine example of how people were collaborating with each other and are doing that eventually space and all came out of atomic energy so vikram sarabhai uh, bhaba supported him very strongly and came in that so i want to come to some examples the first of the challenges in society you know i mean apart from institution building how did we actually start solving one by one challenge when india became independent one of the first thing that was realized by the government that there were 30 different calendars in the country you know different regions we would write a letter to another region in the country and would quote a different date you know, i mean how would you set up with that i mean there is vikram sawa there is shaka and what not you know so okay, everyone would have to then go back and calculate what date actually that letter actually means you know so government decided that they would set up a committee to rationalize all the calendars now, how many of you in the audience know that india has certain national iconic things national bird you have heard of 
national board all of you have heard of national flag you have heard of national anthem you have heard of national animal you have heard of national calendar have you heard of no one right this is a national calendar so say, committee was set up by csi under the chairmanship of meghnath saha no the committee said that we must actually also have a national calendar just like a uh, peacock is our national bird royal bengal tiger is our national animal we have a national flag we have a national anthem there is a national calendar a national calendar was uh, came out of the committee recommendation of meghnath saha and that actually is a prime example that at the time of independence we had decided that we are going to do things scientifically look back upon this the gregorian calendar that we use today has no scientific rationale by 1st january right any day in the world could be 1st january what is the big deal about it mingnath saha committee went into details of the calendar system that were in india and it found out saying that an equinox day must be the first day of the calendar the 21st march is now the first day of the calendar right because the sun would actually then start moving in a particular direction on 21st march it starts moving towards north and therefore equinox must be in a leap year is 22nd march but you can imagine the kind of science that went behind in this committee's discussions was phenomenal and then in 1956 eventually it was gazetted it was passed by the parliament and then it was told to the entire government that there will be two calendars because we have to harmonize with the rest of the world. and therefore gregorian calendar should continue to harmonize with the rest of the world but india will have a national calendar which is called shaka that what we use today, today i think we are 1942 shaka or something so uh, we must have a national calendar and it was gazetted passed by indian parliament and that actually is a prime example that how in every step we have taken scientific uh, steps of those things you know that's the kind of thing but a major challenge came in to conduct the first general elections in 1952 india had adopted democracy as a mode of governance right no one in the world i don't think even nehru and gandhi had ever believed that india could be democracy probably no one when the world would believe that india could be a democracy where people would get a free right to go and vote for any candidate that they wish to india was considered to be a feudal system all through right and people thought that what the boss said the boss himself or herself would go and vote for everyone under that person right i mean that's the feudal system it would work through. but we had to make sure that we would give right to every person to vote and how did we do that no more elegantly than this particular thing we developed the indelible ink you know the national physical laboratory developed the ink that is used even today all of you have voted that ink is put there that was developed by national physical laboratory npl and it was commercialized through mysore ink and even today csr gets a royalty of about 1 crore every year and see sir in fact we secretly wish that there are elections every year you know i mean so that we'll get more royalty but that doesn't happen unfortunately it happens once in 5 years but nonetheless uh, it was developed and that gives now right to every citizen you know i mean to vote and ink can be put here this is one of the first things that we have to do for democracy to implement democracy it is only one of the things that i have to tell you but i will tell you many more different examples 1960s come 1960 62 or something that period we were seeing one of the worst famines in our history it had not rained for 5 years and 1943 memories were not too distant 1943 all of you are aware the bengal famine ever since british came to india east india company started its dominance in india 1757 they won the battle of plassey east india company and took over the governance in this part of the country 1765 was one of the four worst famines of that era million people died in the famine of 1765 immediately after east india company had taken over why because the taxation on the farmers had gone so high that a farmer would produce something in the field and would not get any return on it at all in fact farmer would actually pay to the government to be able to grow something in his or her field 
and every 10 or 20 years trust me since 1760s till 1943 there were famines which ravished through the country so bad that every 10 or 20 years millions would die of hunger millions right you have seen satyajit uh, ray's pathe panchali the last scene you remember the snakes entering the house because people were fleeing they were fleeing away from their houses and no food for people to eat every 10 or 20 years in some part of the country and some of the images i have not actually deliberately shown here are so disturbing there is an image in chennai where a person is sitting next to the family the family is sleeping on the ground for all of them you can see the ribs the person is protecting the family from others who are trying to cannibalize the dead that was the situation in british india trust me every 10 or 20 years there would be a major famine and we are looking at an imminent famine in 1965 from 1965 that particular period of time at that time an appeal was made to us to come to the rescue of quite some wheat or something like that us was initially reluctant then it was eisenhower who the president or uh, roosevelt next year johnson yeah after post kennedy that's right johnson but johnson's wife then impressed upon him that uh, india indeed needs a big support so please send some wheat to india and that's how this pl480 project came into being and today those of you who have gone to the dst building the technology bhavan technology bhavan was the pl40 pl480 go down that's where all the wheat used to be stored and then distributed through the country but then came the master stroke norman borlaug had developed a small variety of wheat you know i mean the wheat plant that doesn't grow and doesn't actually take so so much water and norman borlaug of course was i mean a legendary figure and uh, the people in india including people like somnathan and all who was working in iri had heard of norman borlaug and seen actually what wonders it can do and they impressed upon the government and the master stroke came in the c subramaniam who was then the minister of agriculture he said that let us invite norman borlaug to the country norman borlaug did indeed come brought lots of plants with him and then planted that and that began the green revolution in india 1965 but green revolution would not have been possible only because of the dwarf variety of the wheat green revolution was already backed up by improved irrigation post 1947 most of north india actually we had developed now between 1947 and 65 we had developed large number of irrigation system bakranal dam is a great example of that we also decided that we have to mechanize agriculture we cannot do the traditional agriculture the way it has been practiced over centuries and that job came upon csir and csir the durgapur lab who have a, a station in ludhiana rolled out the first swaraj tech in the so the mechanization of agriculture part came upon csir developing pesticides came upon csir so indians of chemical technology developed large number of agri pesticides and the lab in durgapur and ludhiana csir lab they developed a swaraj tractor and that also becomes one of the first incidences of a spin off company from a lab no spin offs you have heard in many of the western countries us and uk and all but in india also the first of the spin offs was this the scientists came out of the lab and started a company called punjab tractors limited and the punjab tractors limited eventually has been taken over recently by mahindra and mahindra but the mechanization was firmly on place and today i mean you have seen lakhs of these tractors which have been now sold during green revolution and did actually change the face of the country right so combined together the agricultural practices the dwarf variety of wheat and mechanization together made sure that india now would be food sufficient and the famine of 1965 would now not be actually seen again i told you that i'm going to give you many 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 small different examples that every problem that we encountered post 1947 we had decided that we are going to find a scientific solution to that from the major problems was about infant a threat the many kids who would be born and within a few first few days or a month 
of their being born they would be dead because they were not getting proper food and not getting proper food was variety of different reasons uh, non lactating mothers for example or things like that <coughs> so solution for providing proper food would be in milk if you could actually give milk to infants it would be good but milk was not that well produced or the not well distributed it was produced in large number of quantities for example in gujarat it was being produced but it could not have been distributed let us say to places like bengal from there the milk distribution was a problem and one way of solving that problem because cold chains had not been established yet one way of solving that problem to convert milk into milk powder the government set up a committee called a krishan chand committee in 1957 to solve the problem that how do we actually convert milk into milk powder and distribute it all over india so that the infant death rate can come down it had international experts somebody called william bitt from new zealand people from ireland people who actually were expert in milk and milk products they were on the committee and the committee report says that indian milk cannot be converted into milk powder why because in india the milk that is used predominantly is a buffalo milk and buffalo milk is very high in fat in western countries europe australia new zealand and everywhere the principal source of milk is cow that is less fat and therefore they can actually convert their milk very easily into powder but india cannot this problem actually was posed by the committee and the committee report itself notes that however having stated the problem and it is impossible to do this so the best experts in the world are saying this impossible to do it it notes that csir may undertake research to convert buffalo milk into powder and then vargis kurian flew down to mysore to our lab central food technology research institute cftri in mysore and then came up and said that let us start working on this and the problem is so simple for every problem there is a scnt solution scientific solution how do you separate fat from the milk that does the problem and if you centrifuge and centrifuge it enough then you can actually get the fat can be separated from the milk it's not very difficult you could actually design all these rollers and this and that so that uh, the fat can be separated but the moment fat is separated what do you do with the fat of course there is a vargis kurian who pioneered the the cooperative movement he said i can convert this fat into butter what you use today amul butter is the butter that came out of this on the other hand the fat free milk could be converted into milk powder straight away i don't know how many of you remember this tin i mean my generation people would definitely remember the tin uh this is a amul milk powder tin uh but of course the problem remained whether this milk powder is fit for consumption or not and how do you show that it is fit for consumption so you have to conduct clinical trials to show that it can be is fit for consumption and vargis kurian and the team from cftri went to cmc vellore conducted a proper clinical trial to show that it is fit for consumption csr gave a grant for conducting the clinical trial and once it was certified that it is done and when it was marketed the infant death rate came down dramatically in india it was 1960s or 1970s so it was amazing a small problem that country was facing and I, what i want to tell you is that there is scientific solution behind every problem that we have solved and for a long time this tin contained a logo of csir here you know this amul milk and why why i ask my generation people to recall this kind of packet this kind of tin because in our house at least and i'm sure in your houses also when milk powder got over from this particular tin our mothers used to use it for storing dal and other things and when it became rusted then uh, instead of dal uh, we started using uh, storing it for washing powder and other things. so this tin was used for a very long time in our house and i'm sure i mean all of you remember this okay and i'm sure it was pretty much the same story in your houses as well but the thing is a uh, very very elegant solution to the problem that was stated and the krishan chand committee which had said it is impossible we made that impossible possible that's the bottom line of it and that's the prowess of indian thinking innovation and technology that we could actually do at every stage in whatever whenever the problem says the death rate of a uh, children death rate in india has dramatically come down over a period of time the life expectancy which was about 33 at the time of independence today is about 70 all of it would not have been possible you know as i said 
world was watching india that is going to disintegrate but india was doing this this is how india's gdp rose over a period of time and this is how the life expectancy of the, the infant death rate has fallen down every sector that you think of we have implemented solutions which has improved the quality of average indian at every stage is not only the space program is not only the atomic energy program everything that what we did and when covid came now this is my very favorite topic when covid came so remember there is a h1n1 uh, 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 outbreak in 2008 or 9 you know the h1n1 outbreak to a pandemic did not have same confidence in 2008 2009 that what we have today that we could do things here and in fact if covid had come let us say 1970s or 1980s trust me there would be a devastating effect on the country but thankfully 2020 is not 1970 or 1980 india's scientific community is so confident now that given any global problem india's scientific community today you can trust that we will find very elegant solutions for that for each of them let me give you two examples of covid 19 how we made a country proud of uh, giving world class solutions some of the first in class uh, world solutions the western peoples will take a long time to turn around but trust me history will testify that is one of the awakening movements of indian science first of the examples we started developing a diagnostic test we knew that rt pcr uh, is good and rt pcr to scale it up at a level for which we required was not very easy across the country we had to buy rt pcr machines we had to actually have rna isolation machines and so on and so forth it was not very easy so we developed what is called the crispr cas9 based covid 19 testing the world's first crispr cas9 based technique whom we are we competing against we are competing against the university of california berkeley the group of jenny dodna who got nobel prize last year on crispr cas they were also working on a crispr cas based uh, diagnostic kit and they had named it detector there's a mit group led by zhang and his colleagues who have the patent on crispr editing in humans and they had uh, termed their test as sherlock the so sherlock and detector were running race to race to come up with a covid testing kit but we got there first indian scientists got there first and what would we call it this is what we called it peluda fn cas9 enzyme linked universal detection assay this our scientists did the first in the world this and immediately after other things also of course followed from other places but trust i mean how actually we did wonderfully well and as i said this is a real awakening period that presented problem scientific problems our scientists are perfectly capable of finding their solutions on even today's day we found out other methods as well for which were much lesser and much higher throughput uh, for testing all of these are documented in literature we have also published scientific papers based on this this is not only a advertisement and the test was implemented by none other than tatas tatas came and founded a company called tata medical and diagnostics they took the test from us and it was used in large assays because it can be scaled up very easily if there is a gathering of 10000 people the feluza can be used very easily so during kumbhs during other large gatherings of the people this was used and is actually available on bangalore airport if you are walking out of bangalore airport you will see a board of tatas and the test is actually available there on that the, at the airport side well we were the first ones in the world to recognize that covid is an airborne disease it spreads through the air through aerosols we are the first in the world right people are now writing articles in new york times now that is an airborne disease who recognized this fact that it is airborne about a month ago my own blog in csis website is more than one and a half years ago almost two years ago now that covid is airborne right and we know that just like any other airborne disease like influenza or tuberculosis when we cough when we talk when we breathe we continuously exhale this aerosols from uh, oding and the virus which is essentially a respiratory virus would be trapped in those aerosols right 
and these uh, aerosols are very tiny a few micrometers to about tens of micrometers uh, this thing larger droplets settled on our surfaces but when we talk and when we speak we don't exhale droplets which are very large and therefore they remain suspended in air but every droplet has a probability that virus would be entrapped in that right and because we could recognize this as an airborne we immediately came up with the guidelines for ventilation that if a place is well ventilated then the air drops would get dissipated in the air in no time if the place is not ventilated air drops would remain suspended and we went and did air sampling in many different places and we showed that virus was in the air by doing air sampling in a place like this we actually showed that where the virus load was highest and where it was actually lowest and those kind of things actually also are documented in literature now that what we have done but if the virus is airborne once again how do you mitigate that can you not actually when the air is circulated in the room can you sanitize the air and the age old technique 100 year old technique is that if you can use uvc the ultraviolet c radiation then you can inactivate the virus and very simple that when the air is circulated for example in a central ac air air conditioned room before the air comes into the room you installed uv inside the ducts the uv also have to be away from human this thing you know exposure because they can cause mutation in humans but if you are actually concealed in a ahu then you can treat that particular one and we went and installed all these solutions including lok sabha rajya sabha and so on so forth and as late as about a month ago railways have ordered that all the ac railway coaches in india now would have these solutions installed so that any air that is circulated in the coach would necessarily be sanitized with uv ahead of time we also written the letters to all the state transports that all the buses and everyone also would be done that so again first in the world so i mean that's not yet the west the western countries have woken up to the fact that airborne diseases can also be treated and what we have shown is that one reduces the probability of transmission through air by sanitizing the air before it comes into the room the probability goes on dramatically in ac buses coaches and everywhere that probability of transmission actually goes very very less in this now there are many 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 different things that actually i can go on talking about at how we developed a scenario and in fact i skipped one slide in between i will just spend one minute on this that if you were to divide the post independent era into different phases we had an era of self reliance as i told you in the beginning that we had to become self reliant on almost all the technologies and all the institutions were being built then came an era of technology denial many of us actually yesterday when i was showing you the examples of computerizations and all even the computer graphics were denied to india in 1980s you know and then uh, came the era of globalization and this is where actually we are here today that we are becoming more and more assertive partner in globalization of science and technology our assertions are actually quite noteworthy in recent times of how we are asserting ourselves you know but many of you are wondering and i can of course go on giving number of different examples that how different snt solutions have been implemented over the years india became self reliant in production of mentha this something called mentha we are from menthol uh, there is a world market for that india was a net importer we became self reliant in uh, doing that uh, several years ago and so on so forth so the question is we are only talking of technologies that have been implemented and some part of science behind those technologies but has been some outstanding science that has been done in the country absolutely outstanding the same class as the ramans and sahas and boses no less than cv ramans raman effect has been done in the country post 1947 trust me the west will not recognize it unless uh, we actually become very very assertive and the discovery which is parallel to raman effect is that of g n ramachandran no in the biological molecules the first of the biological macromolecules the structure was being proposed was linus pauling the alpha helix and beta sheet the second of the polymer that was being proposed structure of that was the dna that is watson crick rosen franklin and morris wilkins but close on the heels of this the third biological macromolecule structure was proposed was collagen the triple helix the famous triple helix of jain ramachandran it is very difficult to digest 
that in some corner of the world called University of Madras, there's somebody who's sending a paper to Nature and asking Nature to publish it. Nature, of course, published it because you have alpha helix, you have DNA, and you have collagen, right? As complex as the DNA structure, no less complex than the DNA structure. As fundamentally important as DNA and alpha helix. There is an outstanding piece of work that was done by J. Ramchandran there in Madras. And immediately, some of the most notable people of the time criticized the structure heavily, saying that the structure is not very right. There are certain problems with the structure, especially certain atoms appear to be colliding with each other. In that. And Ramchandran was very hurt by this criticism. Of course, he recognized that there were issues with the structure. He later on refined the model and proposed the structure of collagen, which is true even today. And then when he refined the model and sent to nature, nature sat on it for six months and returned the manuscript by surface mail, which took another six months to return. And by then, Francis Crick, the same Crick of DNA, and Alexander Rich published the paper in nature. We can see how it was actually, the games were being played. But nonetheless, Ramchandran published his model in current science. So he also remains the claimant to the correct structure of collagen. But stuck by the criticism that the atoms are colliding there, he decided that he's going to undertake a calculation upon himself that in proteins, the rotatable bonds which are there, how much restriction to the rotations would arise so that the atoms don't collide with each other. And then came out a very famous called Ramchandran plot. It's so famous that no biology textbook would afford not to mention the Ramchandran plot. All the modern biology textbooks in the first few pages would show Ramchandran plot what it is. And trust me, many Nobel laureates whose names you would find it difficult to recall, many Nobel prizes which have been given for discoveries that you would find it actually difficult to recall in your memory, but no biologist in the world would ever fail to recall Ramachandran. He's that class. And that's why I said, just as much as the bosons, just as much as the Raman effect, the Ramchandran plot also is legendary. So no biology student in the world would fail to recognize Ramchandran's contribution there. So why Nobel Prizes are not given to different people is a different matter altogether. And we'll not debate upon that. But nonetheless, his discovery was as profound as anyone else. And all biology textbooks, open up any biology textbook, you will find, indeed find a Ramchandran plot in the biology textbook. And every student of biology would actually tell you what Ramchandran plot really means. The same way, you'll not be able to tell many other phenomena in biology which have won Nobel Prizes and so on and so forth. And that's the thing. The second discovery I actually want to show you is much closer to home. And I don't know how many of you have heard of this person, Shambhunad Deh. Are, are, are people who have not heard of Shambhunad Deh? He was a doctor in Calcutta. And uh, b -b -b it was uh, known that cholera is caused by Vibrio cholerae. And uh, Vibrio cholerae is a bacterium which secretes toxin into our gut. The toxin sits on our intestinal cell surface, enters the cells and carries out an enzymatic reaction because of which the cells burst open and cells lose all their fluids, sodium and potassium and so on and so forth. And the clinical manifestation of that is getting loose motions and you start throwing up. That's what the clinical manifestation of uh, cholera. The discovery that this particular effect is because of the toxin is given to Bunadde. He started an entirely new field of what are called as exotoxins. This field was not known to biology. And in fact, close on the discovery of cholera toxin, people discovered that many other diseases are because of the toxins that this uh, pathogenic bacteria they secrete. Whether it is whooping cough, Pertussis, whether it be E. coli infection in the stomach, and many other diseases which actually have eventually clinical manifestations which are different are because of the toxins, and that field was started by him. And none other than Joshua Lederberg, a very famous microbiologist, nominated Shamuna Day six times for Nobel Prize. He did not get Nobel Prize. Uh, all of us believed once again that Shamuna Day would have been a very richly deserved Nobel laureate, but unfortunately, that was not to be. And uh, this is what actually what he, the first paper that he published about the entrotoxicity of the bacterium in this paper.
it is fantastic just fantastic but because our people were working in one corner of the world and some amount of jealousy that comes in in the white skin people that how can such discoveries happen in india ramchandran or shamuna day and many more people the discoveries were actually not very well recognized or accepted by the west but over a period of time scientific discoveries are scientific discoveries and they would eventually make into textbooks anyway you cannot ignore a scientific discovery because some day or the other somebody is going to say that i have discovered this just like jesse bose all of us know that somebody tried to take credit away from him but we know that jesse bose's credit discovery was what and the due credit is now given to him right in the same spirit both day and ramchandran are great examples of outstanding science that was done in the country right? so i have given you some examples of technologies and i can go on giving many more but i thought i mean also i should give you two examples of some fantastic science that happened and in everybody's mind both of them ought to have been nobel laureates is a different matter that the nobel committee did not choose them the nobel committee did not choose mahatma gandhi what would be a more parody of nobel prizes and why are we actually saying that nobel prizes are so great if nobel committee cannot recognize someone like mahatma gandhi right all those people who followed gandhian principles whether be it martin luther king or whether be it nelson mandela they all got nobel prizes because they were gandhians but gandhi himself did not get nobel prize so i think at time has come that we stop looking to the west as somebody who is above us time has come that we start believing we are no less in our talent we are no less in our creativity and we are no less in our innovation than any of the western countries the western people would eventually come down to their knees and start accepting the fact that we have been a great culture we have been a great collection of people all of us and we are equally innovative and we are equally creative as anyone else in the world and these are two prime examples actually i wanted to show and mahatma gandhi of course i have told you and therefore the value of a nobel prize actually comes down in our eyes much much lower than uh, what we actually were when at least i was a student and i used to think that nobel prize nobel prize something but these actually examples are great examples that the value of the prizes are of course not as high as what we used to think earlier having said that there are great problems that we are staring at right now on today's date the large number of problems that not only our country but we as a human race are staring at right now and i'm just going to give you two examples of that and i will stop there we have to find that our agricultural practices have become rather monogamous that uh, we have growing only wheat or rice or things like that in fact at some point of time we used to grow lot of millets at some point of time we used to grow many other things which we have actually reduced dependence on them and uh, most of the punjab haryana up belt has actually only doing rice or wheat or sugar cane and time has come to diversify agriculture once again and in fact in the beginning of agriculture about 15000 years ago it was predominantly a millet consuming country rice and all that came actually from somewhere else india was a millet country and we had actually forgotten the practices of those but one of the diversification things that what we can do also is aromatic oils the essential oils and we began this exercise uh, about 4 or 5 years ago that uh, we started promoting a cultivation of lavender in jammu and kashmir and about 5 years ago it has caught so much traction that already most of the media has now started uh, terming it as a purple revolution so this is lavender and the lavender oil actually essential oil from lavender sells very well and is already a success story that the farmers in jammu and kashmir have started very yielding some good economic returns out of this and this is actually something that we can also promote of diversification and this one is only one of the examples the second very scary examples is about water availability in india now this is the water graph insa published a book uh, about 2 years ago how the water is 1950s 1960s we had surplus water way surplus water in about 2000 we had become a water stressed country and we are heading very rapidly in about 20 years from now we are going to become water scarce country how are we going to deal with this situation you yeah. know we will have to find ways of storing water somehow But how are we going to do that that's a question and one way of storing water is storing it underground 
you know, I mean, we had a tradition, great tradition. If you, in fact, go to Rajasthan and Gujarat and all, you will see traditions of how water used to be stored there. Or if you go to some of the old forts, you know, Maharashtra or Andhra Pradesh and all, you will see how even at that height, water used to be taken there and it was used to be stored for thousands of people who lived there. And we had to go back to the traditional water uh, pro storage problems. But even more modern water storage problems, such as underground water, I'll give you an example. There's a village close to Hyderabad called Chotupal. It had become a semi-arid village over the last 15, 20 years. At about 60 kilometers from Hyderabad. It was to be green earlier. It had be, started to become arid and semi-arid over a period of time. There's a large-scale migration from village to Vijayawada and Hyderabad. The young people had started migrating. It is at that time we decided that we are going to do the sub maps. You know, I mean, below the surface, are there aquifers and all that exists there? And we use uh, uh, electromagnetic sensors to find out where are the cavities and aquifers and storage capacities below the ground? And our lab in Hyderabad, the National Geophysical Research Laboratory, actually did this. And based on that, we suggested to the Gram Panchayat that if we generate an artificial lake at a particular point, we will be able to recharge the groundwater. The groundwater which had dropped below 50 meters, the layer, in three years, it, can, it had come from 50 to 35 to 15. On today's day, the groundwater river surfaces have already come to 15 meters. And that groundwater is now being used to cultivate paddy in that region. Paddy, the most water intensive crop, one of the most water intensive crops is now being grown in there. So once again, what we have done, including modern technologies, we are able to actually now show how water can be recharged and how we can reuse that particular water. And with this, we have taken a very, very ambitious program. Entire Rajasthan we are mapping for subsurface. The Ministry of Jal Shakti immediately, I mean, when the minister saw this particular example, he jumped out of his seat. He said, can you do it for Rajasthan? I said, of course we can do it. The entire Rajasthan is being mapped. And early next year, we hope to get the entire map of Rajasthan, which is subsurface. And we'll be able to tell that we're actually to do groundwater recharging so that we can uh, even make Rajasthan something like this. One of the problems for the future is going to be use or rather our lack of uh, uh, dependence on fossil fuels. It's a global problem. Fuels is a global problem. We want to actually reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. But the fuels are made of carbon atoms and there are plenty of carbon atoms which are available in agri residues and so on and so forth. And uh, for doing agri residues and all, we can generate what are called as biofuels. You know, I mean, waste agri residues that uh, come out as practice, practice of agriculture, we can use biojet fuel. And about two years ago, or rather three years ago, we were able to demonstrate that we can fly flights. This is the AN-32 aircrafts of Air Force. And this is blended biojet fuel that what we use and demonstrated at the 26th January parade. And uh, about two years ago, we also lay uh, uh, that actually could do that. With the demonstration that we can generate biojet fuels in the country and we can fly actual flights in real life, our planes, on the biojet fuel that has been generated from these agri residues, we became the only second country in the world to fly biojet fuels flight with indigenous fuel. Only the second country. I think these kind of things are to be extremely proud. We have to be very proud that whatever problems that are being posed, either locally or globally, we are capable of finding their solutions. I mean, that's the examples that I've been giving. And in fact, this is, if you happen to travel Indigo, in the in-flight magazine of Indigo, you would see that they see green is the sky. And it says December 2021, Indigo had inked an agreement with Dehradun based Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Indian Institute of Petroleum, to manufacture and deploy the sustainable aviation fuel globally. And as late as in March, Boeing came to India and they have signed an agreement with CSIR that even Boeing would like to be associated with CSIR in generating budget fuels. And that is our promise. Nobel prizes may be given, Nobel prizes may not be given, but wherever commercial interests dictate, people are bound to come to India because the companies know that this is the future and Indian science and innovation and technology are on par with anywhere in the world. And Boeing has now sent an ink with IIP Dehradun for making sustainable aviation fuel. 
clean energy, of course, is going to be the next uh, this thing, uh, wave of innovations. And India has already declared its ambition as hydrogen 212, that is generation of hydrogen of less than $2 a kg, storage and distribution at $1 a kg, and replacement of fossil technology with a return on investment less than two years. That's our ambition. And in fact, about six months ago, we demonstrated, so you would have read the news that Mr. Nitin Gadkari traveled to the office in a hydrogen car or something like that, right? It's a car which has been made by Toyota and sent here. And hydrogen, there are stations in Faridabad and all where we can go and fill in hydrogen in a cylinder with a pressurized cylinder. But we must have our own technologies which are more efficient than that. And that was being able to show about six months ago in Pune, what you see here, Dr. Mashayaka, Dr. Ashish Lele, who is the director of NCL, and Mr. Ravi Pandit, who is the CEO of KPIT, and demonstrated for the first time that completely indigenous technology of fuel cells, we can run a bus on that particular one. And their ambition now is that in the next few months, they should deploy a large number of buses on the Pune Bombay road, which run on hydrogen. If they're able to do that, I think this is one of the dream comes to for all of us. That we can show to the world that we are equally competent on par with anywhere else in the world, that our technologies also would be on par with them. That's how the things are. So I don't think I should take too much time. I've taken a lot of time from uh, all of you. I guess uh, if I start talking about it, I can go on talking about for hours, different, different examples. You know, I mean, many different examples in which we have used SNT innovated them and implemented in the field. How much impact this has had on people is just unimaginable. How much impact? You know, the leather sector alone, you know, leather sector employs about 45 to 50 lakh people. 50 lakh people. And leather sector would not have been possible without all of us implementing appropriate technologies for the tanning of leather and making useful leather products. About 80% of the workforce in leather sector is women. You know? So we have been able to generate employment for people by application of technologies in the sector. And there are many, many such kind of things are waiting to be done. Today, the major problems about solid waste management in all our cities, the problems of distributing clean water to all our people, the problems about sustainable energies, all of these are crying for solutions and all of these do indeed have very elegant solutions available to them. It's only up to us to recognize that such solutions are, they do exist and we can come together and implement many of these solutions for the benefit of our people. Not only our people, it would be also useful for people globally. Um, that's the ambition that all of us should have for the future. So to summarize what I said is that we have had a very rich tradition of SN3 through the ages. We have witnessed a very affluent society until the arrival of the colonial powers. And the affluence was largely driven by strong SNT. Although we missed the fruits of the first and second industrial revolution, the post-independence emphasis on SNT has yielded rich dividends. And of course, many of you know that Article 51A in our constitution also says that we must develop scientific temper. We have a very unique constitution, one of the best constitutions in the world, which says that we have to develop scientific temper. Right? No other constitution in the world says that for any other country. And as we continue our journey, our focus must be on the future of humanity and that of our planet. And I have no doubt with the talent that exists here, I have no doubt that the commitment that everyone has in the society and the backing that everyone in the society has as much as what we have demonstrated during the COVID period, the future of science and technology and innovation actually lies in India. The center of innovation indeed lies in India. And I would not be surprised that in about 20 or 30 years, you would start seeing the fruits of those innovation in our society. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that it's indeed happening. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Shekhar, for a very enlightening 
talk on the history of science and technology of post-independence. Um, we could guess some of the other names. Uh, I think that uh, there is a generational gap in knowing these names. Um, but I have many, much to say as usual. I'll keep my mouth shut and take questions from the audience. Uh, comments, questions, thoughts, please. You might know the sad case of Dr. Shubhash Mukhopadhyay. Oh, yes. So that has been sort of wrapped in mystery in Bengal, at least. Why? Well, I mean, uh, the government then, the state government really had uh, instituted a committee, fact-finding committee, and that consisted of experts who were no experts in this subject. And so this was kind of stopped. Uh, and okay, it was never opened. The Nobel Prize was offered, and he committed suicide. Yeah. Uh, but no other discussion ever happened, it ever ap appeared, at least in, in my knowledge, in any newspaper. Uh, Shambhunate got the, the kind of recognition only because of a signal leadership uh, of uh, none other than Baloram in. in in current science. Before that, nobody knew about it. And on Shuhash Mukhopadhyay, nobody did anything except Tapan Shina's egg doctor came out. But again, I mean, that he was Shuhash Mukhopadhyay was not that easy to see. That's so any comment that even we ourselves pr probably do not have the faith in our own ability to do something. And I think I agree with what uh, Shuhoda said, is that uh, because of the generational gaps and all, we have not heard of the achievements of many of the people that uh, they have done here. And uh, he was obviously one of them. Munad Day was also not recognized in India, incidentally. Not only uh, by Nobel Prize, but also not in India. But Shubhuda might have some better thing to offer to that comment. What he said just now. No, I, I, I don't know the details. But, you know, I know the, the tragedy, but I don't know what happened behind, uh, behind the doors. I... Do you know? I, I, I don't know. Do you have any? Uh, it's true that during his lifetime, Shubhash Mukhopadhyay was not recognized. But of late, in the last two, three years, uh, she was the Durga was the name. She was the first uh, you know, test tube baby. She came out, you know, like, you know, she revealed her identity to the world and acknowledged along with the person, some South Indian, I don't recollect his name, who is given the credit of the test tube baby first in India. But he came and papers of Shubhash Mukhopadhyay here. And although he was given the credit, he said no, and categorically said it was published about one or two years earlier. I am not the pioneer of this thing. After doing the research, I understand, Ashbukhobadai was the first person in India who did that. recognized, and I don't know whether government recognized or that. It's usually publicized. And Durga people, came with that and said, I am that baby. I think most people do recognize around the world that he was one of the first ones to do successful in vitro fertilization. So uh, he was Subhash Bukhobadai was recognized of late, last one or two years publicly. Any other comment from the younger folks in the room? Much, many things he said uh, echo in our generational memories. Uh, yeah. Just in case, um, I, I'll just give you another irony of PL480. So PL480 uh, in our generation was a name we all knew. In Bengal in particular, uh, that crisis led to a change of habit of eating rice twice a day. So 1965, am I roughly right? Sorry, correct. So 19, around 65, I uh, recall that in our house where my father being a doctor opposed eating rice twice a day, but um, wheat became available. And wheat came to India through this uh, program called PL480 that talked about 
was a, a treaty with the US government where um, they would give us uh, wheat and uh, it would be repatriable in rupees. And uh, US government didn't know what they could buy from India in rupees. And they gave it to all the universities which had the strong South Asia programs for buying books. And University of Chicago's Regenstein Library was the chief benefit, uh, you know, benefited mostly from that program. And their collection of South Asian books is astounding, astonishing. And they're all funded by PL 480. So this uh, is the reason I have a, an apartment in Chicago. So I can use Regenstein Library uh -huh. to research the history that I told you about, uh, because it has all the books. And I took a picture, which I'll share with our colleagues. Uh, there is a very, very uh, well-known book earlier, uh, written by Rakhal Das Bandhubadhyay, who discovered Mohenjo-Daro. Um, he wrote Banglar Itihash in two volumes. Subsequently, the two volumes disappeared, and now if you want to buy it, you'll get a single volume. But the two old volumes are in Regenstein Library. I opened it, on the left page was University of Chicago logo. On the right-hand side, there is a line saying, uh, given to University of Chicago by the Library of Congress under PL 480. So I took a, a picture of it to share with my younger colleagues as to the paradoxical consequence of PL 480 in having this extraordinary library of Indian books in the University of Chicago. Today, you can't imagine here, you can't imagine there that they will have that kind of wisdom, but it, it did exist. So this was Johnson's time, I think. That it was time. amazing, but that saved India from a major famine that would have come through. And to imagine that today, when India says that you will not export wheat, there's so many ripples around the world. They have traveled so much here. Yes, Any other comment? Uh, anything you want to say? You, you have heard the story? Did you know any of this? Those who knew, raise your hands. Okay, good. So you, they didn't know. Thank you very much. And um, we had a fabulous beginning of our colloquium series. And maybe, you know, Shekhar Sharmila, you are welcome to come back and deliver another one in future. And uh, to, you know, end the uh, program, may I request Devashishta to please come and give uh, Sharmila and Shekhar a gift. Sharmila, please come. Fantastic. Uh, arrival of uh, these two uh, great scientists and also uh, a people of, of great culture. Uh, we just want to, to give this small token to Dr. Shekhar Mande and Dr. Sharmila Mande and with uh, another uh, request for another two and then later. So thanks very much. We are done. Due to go.